So Frank had me, he wanted to put uh, a beacon on top of the building. Uh-huh. A testahedral beacon. So um, since we have access to all the odds and ends here in this building, I found a, uh, a ceiling fan. Mm-hmm. So the motor already has a bearing in it, uh -huh. and the and the wiring and the piping. Oh yes, yes, a ceiling fan, of course. So if you look under here, uh -huh. there's a ceiling fan motor. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. I just took all the housing off. Uh huh. Uh huh. And so I'm still yet to install it, but you know I need to make a penetration in this pipe and bring the wires out, uh -huh. which are sitting in there right yeah, now. Yeah. Yeah. Right now it's just on display, so that it um, when I do wire it up, it'll have a photo cell on it. Mm -hmm. Can you move it? Yeah, and it'll um, and it'll come on at night on its own. Uh huh. And then it'll just rotate in the wind. Yeah. It can be pretty windy here. Yeah. In the Bay Area. Anyway, it, it was uh, the largest lamp I've ever made. I made this <laughs> other lamp up here. Uh huh. Oh is, yes, yes. Oh, that is a lamp too. Okay. Yeah, it has seven. Uh, LEDs on the inside and on the top of that. Oh my goodness. <laughs> on, on the top of that, it has a photo cell and some batteries uh -huh. and also um, uh, a photovoltaic cell to turn it on, you know, when it gets dark mm -hmm, and it mm -hmm. has a, a solar collector to charge the batteries. Okay. So that comes on at night. It's really beautiful. So now, uh, Dean, maybe at first better tell me your name. Dean Pollard. Okay, and uh, you are from Santa Cruz, I understand? I live in Santa Cruz right now. Okay, yeah. and um, I think you do know something about Eurythmy that maybe everybody else would like to know too. <laughs> maybe, you can, maybe you can share a little bit of that. Uh, yes, you know, um, I'd almost have to share where I came from first. Yes, do uh, that, do that. I don't know how much time we have, but... Um, yeah, we can have as much time as you want. Okay. Um, well, I was, grew up in the Central Valley, uh, a dairy farm, um, and when I was, uh, and I've always had this tendency towards art, mm -hmm. and now that I'm older, I, I see that I, um, I'm probably one of the, you know, I'm a baby boomer, and I'm probably one of those baby boomers that has Asperger's. Oh, yes, uh-huh. Um, so that comes later in my life as a, as a precursor to other things. So, um, when I was 17, I joined the military, the Navy. Uh huh. This Navy recruiter found me out in the fields, irrigating mm -hmm. my father's land. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Amazing that they have recruiters, eh? Yeah, they drive around and look for Amazing. people. Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. So he All found right. me. Uh, it was some destiny thing, I'm sure. Cause mm -hmm. Anyway, while he was interviewing me and, and talking to me about my possibilities of being in the Navy, I was... Uh, I think in this, this Asperger way, it was, re was receiving images from the future, mm -hmm, what was, mm -hmm. was going to happen mm -hmm, to me when mm -hmm. I went in the Navy. Well, when I went in the Navy, I, re I received a lot of trauma. Mm -hmm. I was, uh, you know, uh, sexually assaulted, I was beat up, I was, then eventually um, a man came into uh, the space on the ship in San Diego and tried to, to kill me in the middle of the night with a knife. Wow. So, uh, but I ended up... Um, I ended up waking up because I was dreaming it was happening. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Anyway, um, so um, the Navy wanted to put me back on a ship, and I had to struggle with them to, you know, tell them that I wasn't going to sleep on a ship anymore. But they mm -hmm. didn't understand that, and I lost the movement in my leg. I still have partial drop foot mm -hmm. in my left leg. Mm -hmm. You know, let's just put a brace on your foot and put you back on a ship. Wow. Yeah. Um, it took two years for me to convince them that I wasn't going to go back on a ship, and they just they ended mm -hmm. up just discharging me. Uh -huh. uh, they called it the convenience of the government. Ah. It was a convenience of the government. Wow. Which, and then six months, it turned into an honorable discharge. Uh huh. Uh huh. So. So you've had the experience, but uh, you got out of it all right. I got out of it all right in a sense, but I wasn't. You know, I didn't receive any therapy for the PTSD. I. Yeah. I, um, yeah. That had lingered um, and I think the Asperger's was probably a, a pre-existing condition um, so um, what what do, what do, does the Asperger's actually how does it manifest uh, I 
it's a kind of a little bit like um, socially awkward, um, mm -hmm. difficulty with intimacy. Um, um, I like I said, I have to isolate. Um, but but I uh, I guess I, I can also I, oddly enough I just see images. I mm -hmm. see images and uh, mm -hmm. and experience feelings that that feels like nobody else is experiencing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, like I'm anyway. It's just it's a weird thing. A little bit like Frank with his organ therapy, being very much aware of um, what moves in him. Yeah, yeah, you know? and, so. and and also um, I stuttered most of my life um, since I was a very small kid. Um, I, you know, something happened to me when I was young um, because I had some traumas as a child that I think I switched my handedness also. Oh yes, uh huh. Trauma can switch your handedness, and uh -huh. I was a bit confused about my right, and my left side. Mm -hmm. And not until I went into the military uh, did I come into surroundings where no one knew me. Uh huh. And I could stop stuttering. Uh huh. Because yeah. literally, so you don't have to keep the old patterns going. Right, and I, I, re I realized that at some point that you know, no, um, my living in Hillmar, where I was from. Uh, my family and friends in some way were enabling me to just keep stuttering and mm -hmm. being who I yeah. they thought I was or who I'm supposed to be. Yeah. I had one friend, Peter Stavrianodakis, um, still a good friend of mine. He was the one person that believed in me, I, I can mm -hmm. honestly say, and mm -hmm. I always felt comfortable that he would accept me. It didn't matter who I was. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and that was always a, a sort of a little shining light for me. Yeah, there was yeah. somebody like that in my yes, life. Yes, you have to have somebody that knows you. Yeah, that's amazing. Really knows um, you. Yeah. Uh, so I, um, I was living down at the beach. Basically, I was still in San Diego. This, I, you know, I was trying to get out of the mil. I was trying to stay in the military. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I was a Boy Scout. My dad was a Boy Scout uh, master, and uh, I just. I, I needed the rigor and uh, mm -hmm. the rhythm that... The, and the outdoor life, maybe. Yeah, yeah and being outside, and, yeah. And that was all an incredible, uh, all the technology and the, the, just the rock world of things was interesting for me. Um, anyway, uh, when I was in San Diego, I, living down there, uh, I was on what's called limited duty. Mm -hmm. So I worked a half day and then I could go go home. I mm -hmm. could just live on the base or I could live mm -hmm. off base. And um, oddly enough, one day I came across a friend of mine, Steve Thomas, who uh, a high school mate of mine. He was mm -hmm. a year older than me. Mm -hmm. And Steve and I would party together. And he was into Alan Watts and other spiritual writings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And... Um, he met a guy by the name of Chuck Wine, who was living in Del Mar, down in San Diego. He was an independent filmmaker, director, uh, genius guy, mm -hmm. really mm -hmm. amazing. He was one of the original members of Warhol's factory in, uh -huh. in Manhattan. He hung out with that crowd. So he told us lots of cool stories and, you know, uh, he was our drug dealer and yeah. our, our party mate, too. Yes, yes. Um, he had introduced us to Rudolf Steiner. Uh-huh. Um, so, yeah. Um, at that time, I started uh, running on the seawall oh. in San Diego. Okay. There's a, a seawall about, uh -huh. about, you know, three, yeah. three feet high or so. Yeah, and to about, break the waves a bit. Exactly. Yeah, we have that on Lake Ontario too. That's like a promenade where people yes. walk and skate uh, yes. and, and ride. Mm -hmm. So early in the morning, uh, I lived there at the beach because mm -hmm. I um, I used to be a uh, well, I, I skateboarded in, in the early '70s. Um, so I would skate up and down. And one morning, uh, I had this intuition that I should jump up on there and run on it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I started running on the mm -hmm. seawall mm -hmm. and. The, just the constraint of the of the seawall uh, forced me to be incredibly uh, connected and balanced in my running. Yeah, because you don't want to fall off. You don't want to fall off because it hurts when you fall off. And there were portions of it where you could leap across and, and to the gap and make it. And, mm -hmm. and so I taught myself how to run backwards and run, you know, my eyes closed. And I called it elevated linear running. Really developing <laughs> your physical skills. Yes, exactly. Uh, 
But w the most interesting thing I found out about elevated linear running is that, and I've never, well, I'm sorry, I've never been a scholar or someone that could take the time to sit down and read anything. I, I think I probably learned how to read and retain what I read in the ninth grade. That's, mm -hmm. that's the earliest I could uh, do that kind of thing. Before, that's probably a good thing. Yeah, before the you images get wouldn't, polluted. They wouldn't stick in my head. I would read out what came off the page and it would just, I wouldn't remember what it was because mm -hmm. what, I, what it is, I wasn't being taught how to build images. Exactly. The teachers yeah. weren't teaching me how to build the images well, they in don't my know. mind. They don't know. And, and reading J.R.R. Tolkien helped me to build those images. Oh yes, because that's all images. Yeah, yeah. and my, mm -hmm. my friend Peter uh, was a, was, a, was a Tolkien head, so we, you know, it was, uh, it was a really an important series of books for me. Mm -hmm. I'd fallen down quite a bit. I, I'm, I think I probably bruised or possibly broke a rib one time. Uh-huh. Um, pretty bad fall. But what I realized about uh, ELR, or Elevated Linear Running, mm -hmm. uh, was that when I'd finished the session and I'd go home, because I was doing it every day, suddenly I was drawn to read. Uh -huh. I mean, not just read, but just voraciously read all night. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And I, and, and, I, and I don't want, you know, like I say, I'm not, I, I, I did read, you know, the, the trilogy a couple times over, but, you know, the, that book's hard, too, because of all the pronunciation. And, and um, but I, and, and that was that time when I met Steve, and Steve was introducing me to Alan Watts and Rudolf Steiner and, uh, the whole New Age movement was mm -hmm. a big thing, and mm -hmm. Steve and I started taking iridology classes. Oh, yes, yes. Um, uh -huh. uh, and I was trained as an Bernard, iridologist. Bernard Jensen. Yeah, he was in San Diego. Yeah, yeah. I did that too. Yeah. So, uh, it was a great time, but what I realized was that because I was doing elevated linear running, which is on the symmetry plane, mm -hmm. this right-left uh -huh. thing, mm -hmm. that uh, it was it was stimulating my intellect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was very interesting, and that's, what, that's why I was reading so much, because that was the natural balance to what I was hap happening in my physical, my physicality. Right, yeah. Um, so at that time, uh, you know, because in the Navy I was trained as an electronics tech, um, what's called an I-seaman, mm -hmm. interior communications technician. Mm -hmm. I got a job down at the waterfront um, uh, at the Campbell Shipyard, I was working on 1,200-ton purse stainers, tuna boats, um, putting the sonars, radars, satellite communication terminals on. Um, it was a it was a great job. You know, I, I was I got to go to Panama and Australia, um, the Samoan Islands, all these places that were you know they had canneries and. Uh, and, and reading Steiner at the same time? <laughs> yeah, of course. Uh, yeah, I was. Uh, but it was, it, was, it was, I found myself in conflict. Um, I went to the, the shipyard, and some, I went to the cannery in Samoa, because I was there for a month. Um, it was life-changing. Um, when I went, when I was there, uh, you know, normally I was in the hotel or I was on the ship. But then... Um, one of the crew members said, let's go to the cannery. Have you ever been to a cannery? So sure, let's go to a cannery. Wow. It was gross. Yeah. I mean, it was... I, I would just imagine how that could be. It was terrible. Yeah. The carnage. Yeah. Those poor, those, those amazing, um, those fish. Not just tuna either. Well, yeah, that's whole of that. I mean, that's just a whole other thing. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. just the, the enormous number and the amount and the size of these bluefin and and that they're hauling them out, and there's hundreds of these boats all around the world, and they're yeah. all just greedily, you know. Yeah, without any plan for the future. No plan. They're not thinking ahead. No. And that seems to be a, a, a real issue with, uh, with our present-day culture. There's no, um, this inability to have that seventh-generation consciousness to, uh, to right. think ahead. Yeah, yeah. Um, everything's being served up, you know, in the media, uh, how you're, we're supposed to be. Uh, and anyway... I, I, I quit that job. I mean, I was making good money. I had bought my own condominium and, um, well, and I, I just, I couldn't, I couldn't deal with it. So I got, I sold my stuff, <laughs> all my things, and I got a Volkswagen 66 Splitty 
and um, you know, was living in that. I read, I, you know, I uh, built it out on the inside so I could live in it. Mm -hmm. And at that time, you know, I'd been reading a lot of Steiner with my friend Steve. He and I would meet at the Panikin Cafe in San Diego, and once a week, and we'd meet there and mm -hmm. and share what we'd been reading, and, and we, you know, we were really serious about it. Um, what I found is that you know I have still always suffered with this this all this uh, this trauma, so I was always an awkward individual, you know, in, in my work, in my relationships. Um, but what I found is that this um, exercise, um, art, and journaling, mm -hmm. which is basically you know exercise was my will. The yes. art was this, this sense of my feeling, and the journaling was this more intellectual, that this mm -hmm. threefold um, thing was happening with me, sort of mm -hmm. naturally. Yeah. I was drawn to, yeah. to that kind of a healing. Yeah. Uh, and probably because I have a tendency to isolate anyway, and uh, you know, I have sort of a negative jag also. Um, this sort of blaming kind of thing goes on in my life at times. Um, well, I think that goes on with everybody. Probably. Because uh, we're any, trying to get somewhere, so, you know, I think that's just... Yeah, so... Um, examination. Anyway, I, I just sort of naturally gravitated towards those three activities. So at that time, um, Steve and I were always going up to the Bodhi Tree bookstore on Melrose in, in, in L.A. Um, to get our Steiner books, and we didn't know that there was this worldwide... Um, organization called right. the Anthroposophical Society that was associated with, right. with Steiner's work. Yeah, yeah. We, were, we were just finding his books in used bookstores and, yeah. and, and, uh, and at, the call, at, the, at the university. We'd go to the University of UC San Diego and go to their library and, and find Steiner books. They had a huge collection. Wow. Mm. So we knew we could always go there, but we wanted to own some of them. So we'd go to the Bodhi Tree. Uh, then we found out, reading through the books, that there was this thing called Waldorf Education, and there's a Waldorf school. Our, our friend Chuck Wine uh, told us about it. So we looked up uh, the Waldorf School in San Diego, and we met a guy by the name of Patrick Wacker, mm -hmm. a great guy, an amazing store he had in Mission Beach. Mm -hmm. uh, it was the most incredible, uh, luciferic, harmonic, hodgepodge, uh, uh, tourist touristy things that he would sell, everything from, you know, crystals and jewelry and sunglasses, bikinis, uh, <laughs> to, you know, toy guns and, and uh, any kind of thing that a tourist would want from San Diego. Um, mm -hmm. And in the midst of all that, he set up these couches and these bookshelves and he would sell Steiner books, and philosophical books. And, we, and I would, you know, I'd go out surfing and I'd come back and I, you know, I, he let me put my surfboard in the back of the store and I could just sit on the couch and read Steiner books. There you go. Uh, or if I came down, because I lived up down up the beach a ways, and so I'd skate down. I did a lot of skating um, back then. Anyway, uh, so then I started, he, I, he had a study group every Wednesday night, and so Steve uh -huh. and I started going to his study groups. and. You know, reading the calendar of the soul and, uh, and and reading out loud was really an important thing for me. A really yeah, because it, it develops your speech. <clears throat> it did, and I stuttered, mm -hmm. and so um, it would. You know, it still kind of spooks, spooks me sometimes. You know, when I get stressed out, like now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, you're doing well. Thanks. Um, so that was interesting. Uh, and then I heard about the Rudolf Steiner College, and I went up there, and I saw one of their end-of-the-year performances. They always do a Shakespeare play. Uh, that was when Rene Carrito and uh, Clifford Monks were the lead teachers at the, at, at the center. And uh, uh, we had seen um, Shakespeare's Tempest. That was amazing. Uh, and I just, I just wanted to go, you know. Mm -hmm. So... Um, I, you know, I worked for another year at, at the Panikin, saved my money, and, um, and went up to the Steiner College. Uh -huh. uh, did the foundation year in teacher training. Uh -huh. um, that was interesting because, and very scary, I lived in my van for the first year in the parking lot, and you could do that back then. It was 1987 or something like that. Uh, and I had a neighbor, George Mark.